Welcome to Gloria's Gab Live. I have with me today Kevin Kenner, who is the founder and the director of the Frost Chopin Festival. And we're going to learn all about that today and all the good things you're doing with it. Uh, thank you so much for coming, Kevin. Uh, so happy you are a here. delight and an amazing pianist. So, um, uh, but there's less to talk about. Uh, before we start, of course, I need to thank our sponsor, South Florida PBS. South Florida PBS, if you're not a member, you need to be. Uh, you get one of these wonderful programs every month that gives you all the info on what's happening uh, on the TV stations. And uh, they also have an allhealthchannelTV.com where you can get amazing information, uh, telehealth and everything. And uh, the topic this month, one of the, the focuses is on changing seas. So a lot of great environmental uh, information and shows uh, coming up. Um, so look for that. Uh, so Kevin, we yeah. were talking about so many different things. I don't even know where to start. Um, the Chopin, Fe first of all, let's get the dates for the festival. Sure. Um, our festival runs from the 19th to the 26th of June. And, and we have uh, free concerts. We They're all free concerts. We yes. have five concerts running on 19th, 22nd, 23rd, 24th, and 26th. At Gusman. Gusman Hall. Concert Hall at the Frost School of Music. Right. And the beautiful thing about this is that uh, you're doing, the concerts are free because you have donors who are supporting this. Uh, and... Tell us, well, first of all, tell us who the donors are. Well, um, first of all, um, your big ones. The, well, we, we do this festival in partnership with the Chopin Foundation of the United States, right. which is actually based right here. It's a national organization, but it happens to be based in Miami. And that was one of the reasons why this thing started in yeah. Miami, mm -hmm. uh, was because of that, that uh, connection. Um, and then the Emily Pierce Foundation has been supporting us for a number of years. Um, and most recently, the Patrick Park Foundation, um, and uh, and a number of of individual uh, sponsors who mm -hmm. who have just you know some of them anonymous. They don't even wish to be named, yeah. but they've just out of the goodness of their hearts, they just support uh, what we're trying to do. So. Well, and the wonderful thing about this is because it's free concert. Um, you're actually helping uh, musicians in Ukraine, uh, so that's like one of the bonuses of attending these free concerts, you can attend the free concerts, but you have the wherewithal to donate some money to help these. And you were telling me about your experience. So just tell us a little bit of snippet about that. Well, I, I feel very strongly about uh, this campaign to, um, it's a relief fund to help um, Ukrainian musicians. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, originally our intention was to have free concerts and if people wanted to donate money to to help keep the festival running in future years, then that would be great if they're inclined to do so. But uh, after we heard about this war against Ukraine, um, we felt it would really be remiss if we didn't um, respond in some way, uh, because this is not just a, a war about land. It's really a war about Ukrainian culture, the Ukrainian people, their language, their music, their art, uh, their literature. Uh, and uh, so I, you know, I feel very personally touched by this because I have friends and colleagues in Ukraine. And uh, uh, when I asked them about their situation, if I could help them, um, I actually have some property in Poland. Uh, they, uh, within 15 minutes, they had a family uh, that, that was trying to flee Bucha. And, mm -hmm. uh, and so we're housing them and, and they're, they're like family to us now. We love these people. She's mm -hmm. a wonderful writer. And uh, she introduced us to um, other musicians and, and people mm -hmm. of, of culture who are also refugees now living in Poland. And I just, uh, when we hear the stories of the musicians who are still in Ukraine, mm -hmm. the ones in Mariupol, for instance, right. they need help. They need help just to stay alive. And I feel that our festival, if we can just do anything to preserve the culture and, and these these treasures uh, that really um, preserve that culture uh, you, in Ukraine, then we want to help them. So we're, we're just asking people who come to our concerts that if they enjoy the concert, 
and they feel the urge to do so, they're welcome to donate to the, uh, uh, it's the King Baudouin Foundation. It's a nonprofit here in the U.S., which is working with the Lisa Batiashvili Foundation in Germany, right. uh, which is helping these Ukrainian musicians who are stranded in, in, in Ukraine. They have no future. They've lost their instruments, their jobs, uh, their, their, their schools. It's, yeah, it's awful. And, you know, I was telling you before that, uh, you know, I'm a member of the Coral Gables community, uh, excuse me, Coral Gables Women's Club. Yes. And, uh, and we wanted to do something for the Ukrainian people and had thought, different ways of doing it, different avenues. And then when you came across my desk, it was like, oh, this is perfect, you know? Uh, so we actually just did a little fundraiser uh, at our Gringo Bingo, or monthly faith fundraisers, but uh, we wanted to give a portion of proceeds toward your effort. So wow. I have a check. Three hundred dollars oh, wow. toward your your efforts and uh, put that in your little Thank uh, you, that, box so of collections. Grateful to the women's club for doing that. You know, yeah, three hundred dollars uh, will go a long way to helping a person in Ukraine right now. Yeah, it really and, makes a uh, difference. Yeah, and and we're so happy to do it. And uh, and it's it's a uh, for us it was a more personal way of giving the money because you know you already have that connection. Uh, yes. So um, anyway, we're happy to do it. But let's talk about the the festival and mm -hmm. all the other stuff surrounding the festival because it's not just the concerts. We've got opportunities for music teachers to come in and learn how to teach. Yeah, we, students, we have so. a, an accompanying academy. Mm -hmm. and actually, that was sort of the, the founding idea at the very beginning in 2018. Right. Uh, when I spoke to the Chopin Foundation, I knew that their mission, they have an educational mission uh, to give opportunities to young American pianists mm -hmm. to study the music of, of Chopin, to familiarize themselves with his style. And, uh, and so this all started as a, as a Chopin Academy. Um, mm -hmm. But when I brought in these, these specialists to work with uh, the students that we chose, we have just 21 students that we've specially chosen from all over the world. And some of them are really young. We've got 13 year olds and, and, and as old as 29. So there's a big range there, but um, we started bringing in these international artists who right. are just at the very top of the field and we thought, well, wouldn't it be wonderful if they also, you know, performed uh, yeah. not just for the students, but for the people of, of, of South Florida. Mm -hmm. uh, some of them are coming in from Europe and, and they don't perform here very often. Um, so uh, we have some really big stars coming in to perform at these festival concerts. And so the Academy and the festival sort of became one big okay. uh, celebration of, of, of Chopin. And... Uh, we're doing not just the concerts, but but workshops and master classes every day of the week. And those are free can, as well. Oh yes, yes, yeah. absolutely free. You don't even need to register. You can a watch ticket. the master classes. Go to the Frost School, <laughs> and go to Gusman Concert Hall, mm -hmm. uh, Monday, Tuesday, the the twentieth and twenty first at seven p.m. Uh -huh. We're flying in uh, John Rink, Professor John Rink from uh, University of Cambridge in England, mm -hmm. who is one of the world's top Chopin specialists. And he'll be doing a workshop with the students on uh, one evening on Monday will be about Chopin etudes and mm -hmm. on Tuesday Chopin nocturnes. And okay. the students will all be up on the stage working with him. Uh, and people who want to just observe, they can sit out in the audience and, and watch That's perfect that. for music teachers. Yes, so in fact, exactly. teaching. Uh, yeah. And all and every day from and students uh, Monday to Friday, I know from 11 to one mm -hmm. and three to five. Uh, we also have what I call open lessons. They're basically individual lessons with the students, mm -hmm. with these teaching masters. Mm -hmm. um, and th it'll be at various halls at the school that okay. they can just go and watch them teaching the students individually. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's it's really fascinating to see what goes on behind the scenes. Uh, you, you see these great pianists, you know, performing these. We'll have a lot of of our young, all of the, the academy students will be performing at the concerts as well. Yeah. Sort of at the top of the of the ticket. And um, and to be able to see what brought them to that point, how they work individually with the teachers, I think is very interesting. Yeah. Well, speaking of uh, being a young prodigy, I mean, at 17, was it that you came in 10th in the Warsaw uh, Chopin? Yes. Uh, I, 
I was very fortunate. I, the youngest I was, ever. It's probably the youngest ever. Not youngest not? ever, but I was but the youngest, youngest that, that year. year. That's yeah. right. And, and then ten uh, years later, you won it. Well, yeah. Uh, I, I, um, I always loved Chopin since I heard him. You know, one of the first pieces I played was a Chopin Prelude. And was it? And uh, so, when did me, you start? How uh, old were you? I was five. Yeah, and then I had a Polish of course. teacher. I had a Polish teacher when I was uh, oh, okay. twelve years old, and then he saw that I had talent, and so he pre prepared me for the international competition. I don't know what he saw in me, but he felt that I should do that, and I, and I went, and it was a life changing experience. It was the first international competition I'd ever wow. done. I had yeah. no idea what it was about, you did, or how big it was. Oh yeah, right? I, I, it was just like I wasn't oh, nervous or anything because I. <laughs> you I should have thought, been, but you weren't. I saw people on stage who were actually. They, one of the boys fainted. He actually fell off the piano. He no. was so nervous. Yeah, because he hyperventilated. Oh. You know, and all these television cameras and things. For me, I was just oblivious. I had no idea. So I had fun. <laughs> See, I had a yeah, great right. time. I didn't Ignorance win. is bliss. Is that the you deal? Know, I was tenth, but then I came back ten years later, and I knew what was going on then. Yeah. So that was the time that I won. And uh, and it's interesting because actually some of the people that I'm bringing to this festival, uh, Garrick Olson, for instance, he was mm -hmm. the first American to ever win uh, the Chopin competition in Warsaw in its whole history, which goes back to the 1920s. Wow. And uh, uh, he won in 1970, and he's coming to our festival. And I remember listening to him when I was just a little boy uh, his live performances on LP from the Chopin competition and mm -hmm. thinking, wow, wouldn't it be something if I could play in that competition? Right. Yeah. You know? And I, he was like an idol for me. Yeah. Right. So, and now he's like a friend. And yes. A couple of <laughs> years ago, we met, we were judging a competition in the Czech Republic, the Prague mm -hmm. Spring competition. And it was the first time that I met him and I was just enthralled. And he's just such a wonderful person, a, a gentleman. Mm -hmm. a, a great artist, a wonderful teacher. Um, yeah. Just, I, I can't say enough about him. And he's closing our festival on the 26th. That will be a very special concert because he doesn't play so often in, in, in South Florida. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, we expect a big crowd for that one. Oh, yeah. well, I, so people, I hope so, yeah. So, so how do people go about reserving their, their tickets? Uh, well, if you go online to www.frostchopin.com, festival.com right you can uh, see all the concerts the whole lineup okay you just click on it and make a ticket reservation okay. the, the the opening concert i'm sort of sorry to say is sold out i'm not really that sorry I'm not that sorry <laughs> but, but, you know people can still show up because sometimes people register a no ticket show. and then they don't show yeah, so right. we we could have standbys um but yeah i mean tickets are are going very fast so yeah. uh, I well, mean, they're very cheap, aren't they? So. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Why not? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, um, so now, tell me more about um, how how you developed as a pianist and how you relate. You must relate really well to all your students, I would suspect. Uh, yeah. Do they? Do a lot of your students have, have? Did they start at early ages like you did? I I think. Um, that it's sort of customary now that that you know they're the introduced piano, really? people who want to be pianists are usually starting at very young ages yeah. and uh and and i would say that that almost all of the people showing up at our at our festival um probably started even younger than me okay uh, now you're starting your your hand span when you're little how do, how does that work they ju you just pick different pieces that they can play at a yeah, there is some hand stretching stuff you can do. There are all exercises we can learn to do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, part of it is just genetic. If 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 you you know, my <laughs> my sister actually, my sister Judy, uh -huh. she was the big talent in our family. I we were a family of I have four siblings, and yeah, uh, but she had very small hands, and uh, no matter how much she stretched her hand, it wasn't going to reach more than an octave or so. So oh, no. she had to give it up. But you know, there are certain limitations. But yeah. still, there is some great pianists out there in in, in the history of of, of of piano performance, like Alicia de la Rocha, who was one of the great pianists who had very small hands, and somehow, I th would like to think that what makes a pianist great is not the size of their hands, but, but what they do with those hands, how they can manage to get through all the difficulties. It's 
if you have a strong enough musical impulse and concept, uh, you can always find a way to yeah. to express what it is. So, yeah, I, uh, but I, I, you know, I, I don't have enormous hands. I think they're getting smaller now. You know, I'm almost 60. And is it possible that they shrink? Well, I know, I know other parts of you shrink. Yeah, <laughs> so so probably it would make sense, bit, maybe. But, but I'm not giving up yet. Yeah, you know, no, I would. <laughs> I've got a few more years left in me, I hope. But, um, I would certainly hope so too. Yeah. Oh my goodness! So, um, so, but tell it. Tell us a little bit about your story because um, mm. you you started. You you studied. You went to Warsaw. Then what happened? Well, that launched my my career. I uh, yeah. I, I lived in Europe at the time. I, I had been studying in Germany uh, when I won the competition. So oh, okay. And then uh, a lot of the concerts that came in were in Europe. And right. so uh, I made my home in England. I lived there for almost 20 years. I have oh, three wow. daughters that are all um, English grown up now and living in England. Yes. Okay. One's a doctor. One's a cellist. Uh, one is still studying. Uh -huh. And um, and then I uh, and then I met a, a beautiful uh, Polish girl and yeah. I lived in Poland for about four or five years. And uh, and then we moved to Miami and she had a son from an earlier marriage. So so. He's like a son to me now, and right. he's he's uh, studying oboe, which is uh, oh, that's what we were instrument. talking about. I was telling, yeah, yeah, you, you played I, the clarinet. I was telling right? him I, I I took clarinet and I hated those reed reed instruments. They were just it's, hard. It's hard, and I, yeah. I see how hard uh, these oboe students work. You know, sitting at tables doing with gouging machines, trying to make their own reeds. Yeah, I mean, it's a labor of love. They probably yeah. spend two thirds of the time making the reeds and one third of the time making the music. I mean, pianists have it easy. Yeah, really. You just sit down and play. It's, it's ready made. Yeah. Um, but, but of course, when they make a sound, it's like a sound that the, even the piano can't make. I think it's exactly. just so beautiful. Yeah, it is. Yeah. 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 It's like the sax too. I love so, the sax, you know. Uh, so, uh, but the piano um, is the touch. There's so much, there's so much that has to come out of you, you know, spiritually, I think almost to, to play some of these pieces that you play so beautifully. Uh, well, and I, I listened mean, to I, some it's... of them, by the way, <laughs> <laughs> I got you online. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> yeah. Well, I've always loved it. My, my mother actually, um, um, she grew up in a farm in Texas, um, just a little farming town. And, and my father grew up in the depression. We're in Texas. They, uh, Childress, Texas. You would never have heard of it. It's it's near Amarillo. Have you ever um, heard of White Oak? No. Longview? No, no, because I didn't grow up in Texas. I mean, Lubbock? I grew up in California. Oh, okay. Uh, she left all that behind, but you know, she, she had a tough life. Uh, she oh, married yeah? when she was fifteen, <laughs> and lived in various parts of the country and and even in parts of Mexico where they they were ra uh, racing horses. Uh, so she had no connection to musical culture, any kind of culture. So when she was raising her children, she wanted them to have some creative activity. And she bought this little piano. And I grew up with that. And I was Okay, but you said you were around. raised in, in California, but you yeah. you were born in Texas? No, no. Oh, I was wait. born in California. She left Texas. Oh, she uh, left early on oh, with her okay. husband. They went to Colorado and then I oh, believe okay. they went to like uh, Tijuana, Mexico. Uh -huh. they lived there for a while. And then Los Angeles, and finally she ended up in San Diego. Oh wow. And uh and and that's when she started raising uh, my sister and, and my, my well from the first marriage she had three and then my uh, from her second marriage uh, the two of us uh, my uh. sister and I and that's when she got this piano and she just wanted us to um, have some experience you know with music or something. Why well, I think she everybody should. Hmm? I think everybody needs to take an instrument or learn yeah, something I, about music. I think it's a beautiful. Um, you know, I'm so outlet, happy. I sing know? in a choir now, but you know, I can read music because I had clarinet as a kid, right? And I sang in the choir as a kid too. You know, but uh, it's something for life, I think. And I, uh, you know, I know so many people, uh, including my own children. I, uh, one of my daughters is now a doctor. I'm mm -hmm. very proud of her. Yeah. But she practices her violin every day, and I see that it's it's something yeah. of, of of great passion for her. It's yeah. her outlet at the end of the day to be able to make music. And I get that. Uh, and I feel yeah. it's my passion too. It's not, I mean, I'm, I am so fortunate that I can make a living making music because doing it's what the you thing love that to I do. love doing. Yeah, know? right, right. So. And then to be able to share it. 
yes. even better. It, you know, it is it is very special to yeah. see that you make some change or some that you you add some beauty to someone else's life. I think it's a it's it's a marvelous experience. So, so now, when you teach when you teach piano, do you teach um, do you teach courses that are for specific composers, or do you teach um, technique, or are there what are the different types of classes that you teach? Well, of course, at, at the Frost School of Music, yeah. um, you know, we're teaching all composers from all periods yeah. and <clears throat> working on on technique and all kinds of of development um, for for these young pianists. At, at the academy, at the at the Frost Chopin Festival, when we're working with students there, we're working specifically on the music of Chopin. Of and, course, uh, because yeah. it is a composer that I I feel merits a lot of special attention. Uh, is a composer that is. Um, I would say rarely played well. <laughs> he's, he's an elusive composer, you know. He's yeah. he's he's very unlike other composers from his yeah. period, from his generation. And he died so young. He did. He did. Yeah, he had was... a pretty tragic life, and, yeah. and that's one of the interesting things about um, Chopin is that uh, his music uh, expresses a lot of loss, a lot of pain. Uh, there's a word in, in Polish, żal. Uh, which sure. we it has connections to to this anguish and and uh -huh. regret and to uh, feelings of loss that that really stem I think from uh, love of his country which was occupied by three countries at the, by three empires at that time mm -hmm. uh, but where he lived it was under Russian control and uh, and when we hear he works like the revolutionary etude that I'm sure everybody's heard of. Yeah. Um, you know, that's that's expressing the pain of his of his compatriots. And he left Poland when he was just a teenager and he had to leave his family behind, his friends. There was mm -hmm. an uprising against uh, uh, this occupation in mm -hmm. 1830 and 31. And he wasn't there. Uh, and some of his friends died in that uprising. And so all okay. of that is, you can hear that in his music. And yeah. I think it's so interesting now Poignant. that we have yeah. this situation in Ukraine where they are also being invaded and occupied by a foreign country, the same, the same country actually. And um, <clears throat> the, it made me very interested uh, when I saw, for instance, Ukrainian musicians, pianists, who were playing outside, you may have seen them on TV, with these pianos, they were playing, which composer were, do you think they were playing? Chopin. Chopin. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. because they relate to that. His music yeah. speaks to them. Of course. It speaks to everybody in, the, in, in their own which way. Which is why but, it's it's so beautiful that uh, you're you're helping Ukrainian musicians uh, and, and that they're, a lot of them are, are going to Poland for refuge. And uh, yeah, so it it, yes. it really and does make a lot of sense. And it's such a beautiful way to to help support them. I, I think so. And I, I wanted to emphasize that shared history and, and this um, the commiseration of, of the countries around Ukraine, like Poland, that have mm -hmm. been so generous now. Right. They have just opened their arms up to yeah. nearly 4 million it's, people yeah, from we, Ukraine who've come and have just moved into homes. Yes, and they're there for however long. They no one has any idea, and yeah. and I, I I'm just it, it made me so, um, it just made me want to to do what I can, yeah, and which you are uh, doing. Well, yeah, I mean, for instance, this family that we're housing introduced mm -hmm. me to this young pianist who mm -hmm. uh, she's 16 years old. Uh, and in 2014, when she was, I don't know, just <clears throat> very young, uh, her family had to flee Crimea. And they moved to Irpin, which is one of those cities that was heavily damaged now. So they've had to flee Irpin, and they're also living in, in Poland. And this family that we're housing introduced me to her. She was practicing on my piano in Krakow. No. And, and, wow. uh, and she sent me a little video of her, and I was just... This is an amazing, she's, it's just a little genius. Yeah. So I immediately thought she has to come to Miami. She needs to be heard. She right. needs to study with these masters. And, and we need to give her every opportunity to pursue her dreams. She, yeah. you know, a child shouldn't have to go through this. 
Yeah. She's just a child. Yeah. But she's playing some of the most difficult works in the repertoire, like the Hammerklavier Sonata of Beethoven, which very few pianists can can manage that. Can manage that, yeah. Garrick Olson being one who does a beautiful job of that. Um, but, you know, so she'll be here. She'll be performing at Friday's concert, the 24th. Oh, wow. And That's cool. She's not only going to play Chopin, but I let her also play music of her homeland. She will play work by Lysenko, uh, oh, a, a, fa really? a Ukrainian fantasy. And I want nice. people to listen to Ukrainian music. I feel it's music that has been um, sort of... Overlooked? Well, it's or it's what? been overlooked and it's and it's actually been suppressed. You know, it's illegal to oh. play Ukrainian music in, in Russia now. I, I One of my colleagues was arrested Get for, out. for playing Ukrainian music. Yes. Oh, wow. That's the kind of cultural genocide that's going on there. Yeah. And, uh, so, I, think, I think most people don't realize the extent of... No, it's more than just yeah. it's more than just tearing apart a city uh, and gen it's cultural genocide, like you it said. Is. On and, top and of it, I've discovered this music. Um, mm -hmm. We're bringing a fantastic soprano, and this is just a coincidence. Olga Pashechnik, who I have known for years, she lives in Poland, but uh -huh. she is of Ukrainian. She is from Ukraine. Right, um, is one of Europe's most sought after. Sopranos, and we recorded Chopin songs together. Mm -hmm. And I asked her a couple of years ago. I said, "Would you please come to our festival?" And and we had to cancel that festival in 2020. Oh, that's when you had to cancel, yeah. yeah. Because you know, when you're doing Chopin songs, you want to have a good Polish speaking. You know, her Polish is perfect. So, uh -huh. um, she we had to cancel that. And then I said, "Please come when we have the next live festival." So mm -hmm. she planned already last year to come to this festival, and when we heard the news about what happened in Ukraine, I asked her, I said, do you think we could do some Ukrainian music? And uh -huh. she said, of course. And she sent me the music and Perfect. I just fell in love with this. It has the same power of expression as, as what you find in Chopin. Uh -huh. And so on Wednesday, 22nd, yeah. uh, that's going to be a very special concert that she'll be performing music of Poland and music of Ukraine. Right. Yeah. So, okay. Now we have a clip. Oh, yes, yes. We almost forgot about it. Right. Yes. <laughs> hey, uh, can you, Jillian, can you give us a, um, oh, here you go. Garrick Olson. There Garrick Olson. Go. And he, you said he's the last in the series? He's on the 26th, uh, Sunday evening at 7 p.m. And this is him playing a bit of the Hammer Club, your Sonata Beethoven, that very difficult piece. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Yeah. And you're, this is the, what, what the, the girl this was playing? This is what the girl the was young playing. Girl, oh, yes. my goodness. We can't hear it, but uh, I'm, I'm assuming you can hear it when you uh, live, right? Yeah, so, uh, yes. Nope. Yeah, he's going to be playing uh, Chopin, of course, but also music of Brahms. Uh, oh, really? His recent project is actually to play all the music of the piano music of Brahms, uh -huh. and uh, I'm just—he's playing the the the, the great first sonata, this uh, sonata in C major of Brahms. It's a monumental work. Uh -huh. uh, he seems to do monumental pieces. He know? does. Huh? <laughs> yeah. It, and I don't know how he does it. It just, it never ends for him. He's just had a phenomenal career. He, yeah. um, he was f f sort of famous. Uh, we all know that he has like 70 piano concertos under his belt that he can just bring up like that. He's has a mind that just, wow. yeah, yeah. That's yeah. Gary Colson. That's more than muscle memory. <laughs> yes. Yes. That's nuts. 70? <laughs> I couldn't remember 70 songs to sing. Yeah. yeah. Oh my gosh. I can't even so, remember the name of all my students, you know. Hey, well, my gosh. The lessons. It's, well, they, they keep they keep changing. <laughs> <laughs> Don't graduate. <laughs> I just learned your name. <laughs> so, uh so how are we doing on time, Julian? How much? Okay, because we didn't start on time, so I oh, right. usually look at the clock and say, "Oh, we're almost done." So, uh, so what else can you tell me? You got any other prodigal well, students coming up? Um, yeah, we have a Thursday concert we didn't mention about, and that's okay. a very unfortunate. That Dini Yoffe, who is a, she won second prize at the Chopin Competition in 1975, has unfortunately come down with COVID, um, and so she will not be able to fly out here from Germany. And uh, so I am replacing her. Um, and I 
am going to be playing some Ukrainian music as well, as Here well as go. Chopin. So I invite people to come out and listen to that. It's very interesting how this Ukrainian composer that I'm playing, uh, he lived only about a two-hour drive away from another great Polish pianist and composer, uh, Ignacy Jan Paderewski. <laughs> it means that those areas of Ukraine, where so many of the great Polish composers like Szymanowski and Paderewski came mm -hmm. from, uh, that was all territory also for Ukrainian composers. Okay. And, you know, that's that shared traditions that exist mm -hmm. between Ukraine and Poland. I thought that was a beautiful um, discovery when I right. when I realized that Lyatoshinsky, Boris Lyatoshinsky, was living around the corner wow. from some of the great Polish composers. Yeah. So um, I, I hope people will uh, listen to that music. Well, you mentioned COVID, and you and I talked about this earlier. Um, I recently went to a Gable stage performance, which was amazing. Um, mm -hmm. Your magical thinking. And every single person in the audience had on a uh, mask. And I appreciated really that because, you know, the numbers are spiking. And yes. uh, so we were just talking about whether you can require it or suggest it, but certainly um, for your for people looking, uh, if if you plan to attend, uh, highly recommend that you come prepared to wear a mask because yes, yes. it's very if, important. Especially some of these concerts are sold out. So well, you it, were telling me if they're sold out and <clears throat> and not, the ramifications yeah. of one person getting it for you yes is like enormous. And if you Absolutely. got it, oh my That's, gosh! Yeah, but yeah. it runs the gamut of putting you. Or your our school students out of as it. well, who then yeah, have to exactly. isolate and they can't go back home afterwards. They, they you know, we we have it's made arrangements lot. for all this, but uh, I would, you know, I'm still consulting with the university on this uh, because obviously I take advice from, you know, the, our professionals who are obviously, there and looking yeah. at the the numbers and and whether it is safe. Right. Um, but we certainly uh, are are going to have masks available for people and and uh, you know hygienic. Uh, you know the the hand sanitizer, but it is a free concert, so I'm I'm hoping that you're able to say, "Hey, come on!" I do wear hope a mask. That people will be careful. It's not like they, they paid for it, yeah. and you're not giving them something that they paid for. <laughs> yes, exactly that. Exactly so, that. So, so I'm um, thinking you probably could mandate it, but probably. Um, and and if, you know, if the university feels that that, it, that we can, I, I and I will this be live streamed? That. Oh yes, well that's the other thing. Is well, that, so is if that, they don't, if they don't want to wear a mask and they still want to see it, they can live stream. That's it. something yeah. that we, that the silver lining of last week's virtual festival was that we learned how to do all of that, and so all yeah. of our concerts will be live streamed. So if you're not feeling well, or if you know if you're living outside the city, or if you if you if you live up north mm -hmm. uh, and you can't be here, you can live, you can just watch the live streams. Um, we really welcome that. Um, so. So we just go to the website and you can... Yes, they're from the on. website. It's they're from the website. It's frostchopinfestival.com. Mm -hmm. And Easy all peasy. the information is there. You just mm -hmm. click on the concert and then there's there's it'll take you to the live stream. Right. Or to the ticket oh, if that's you become a person. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, so, well, I look forward to attending one or two of them if I can. Thank you. Uh, You're but, very invited. But, we'll, get, we'll get you a seat somehow. For, you for will. For our concert, that little VIP seat. You, oh, somewhere. no, no. You just you just tell me. I'll, I'll tell you what days I'm available. You go, okay, this is the best concert to go to. Yeah. Whatever. Uh, and my thanks anyway. again to the Women's Club. Uh, yeah, oh, That's no. Really uh, you know, we're we're uh, so supportive of what you're doing and uh, and I just think it's a wonderful gesture to be able to use this concert the way you're using it and uh, and I thank you so much for coming I think my time is up uh, but uh, I'll look forward to seeing you again and maybe have you back in future. Thank you Gloria, yeah, I'd love yeah. to come back and see so, again. Uh, yeah. Again thank you uh, South Florida PBS for sponsoring our show today uh, and every day uh, that we do it. I will see you next week uh, and look forward to um, bringing you more great information on what's happening in our, our in South Florida and this nonprofit community. Have a good week. <laughs>